With a major battle brewing in Syria and a major storm brewing near the U.S., we have a lot to cover today. I'm Carl Azus, explaining world news for CNN 10. Nations around the world have been watching and debating solutions for years to the bloody civil war in Syria. It started in 2011. Hundreds of thousands have lost their lives. The war has involved different rebel groups and some terrorist groups who are fighting the Syrian government for control of the country. And that government, with the support of Russia, has gained back a lot of ground. There's one last significant holdout for Syrian rebels. It's in a city named Idlib. But this is also a de-escalation zone, a place where fighting is supposed to be limited, and many Syrian civilians have fled there from other parts of the country for safety. Syria says terrorists there have forced the government to attack. Syrian and Russian forces have carried out more than 100 airstrikes on Idlib. But the U.S. and some other countries want these airstrikes to stop. They say Syria and Russia are using the terrorists as an excuse to attack, and that the militaries have targeted hospitals, medical facilities, and civilian volunteers. The United Nations says there are nearly one million children in Idlib, and that the crisis in the city could turn into a humanitarian nightmare. Among the millions who've been displaced in Syria's civil war, more than 30,000 people from Idlib alone have been forced to flee. Yet another Syrian family is on the move, like millions of others over the last seven years who fled their homes as their towns and villages became battlefields. This family is fleeing for the first time from rural Idlib. They lived in an area that had been spared the fighting until now. It was the first time we saw bombing, says 15-year-old Layla. We've seen it on television and on phones, and now it's right before our eyes. Syrian government and Russian aircraft have intensified airstrikes in preparation for the much-anticipated offensive to regain control of Idlib province, the last stronghold held by an armed opposition now dominated by Islamist extremists. Leila's family has come to a camp, one of many, near the Turkish border. Their tent isn't ready. It's hot. They're tired. Others arrive. More than 30,000 people have had to leave their homes in Idlib in the past week. Half the population here comes from other parts of Syria, now under government control. Leila's father, Abu Muhammad, pitches in with setting up their tent. When it's done, he goes to get Leila. She's been unable to walk since childhood. Their tent is bare. They left home in a hurry, leaving behind most of their possessions. We escaped with only our lives, says Abu Muhammad, who worked as a stove repairman. The UN gave us this tent, but nothing with it. It's a new home Leila is finding difficult to come to terms with. Ben Wiedemann, CNN. At least five American states and the District of Columbia have declared states of emergency. This is an effort to make sure that help and funding are there for those who need it when they need it. And the reason for this is creeping up on the U.S. East Coast. At one point on Wednesday, Hurricane Florence weakened a bit to a Category 3 storm with wind speeds of 125 miles per hour. But it's still one of the strongest storms to stalk the area in decades. By noon on Thursday, forecasters say that the North Carolina coast will feel the blast of tropical storm force winds and that hurricane force winds and dangerous storm surges will be lashing the state Thursday night. But while they don't know exactly when and where Florence will make landfall, forecast models are predicting that the storm could slow down right at the coast and then turn to the southwest. So here's how it happens. Here's our hurricane, right there. What we're steering it with now is this high, pushing it that direction. Well, all of a sudden, by Friday, there's another high right there saying, not so fast. You're not going to go any farther than that. So now I'm going to push you ahead to what happens Saturday and Sunday. You would think, oh, there's a little, there's a glitch there. You can get up through here. You can go to the north. No, because by then, another high is here, blocking it this way, blocking it this way, and blocking it this way. No place for it to go, 
except right where it is. And that's what's going to make all the rainfall for hours and hours and hours. And that's why CNN meteorologists say this is bad news for the coasts of North Carolina, South Carolina, and all points inland, because in addition to sustained hurricane winds and storm surges, Florence could bring as much as 40 inches of rain to these areas, and that could cause catastrophic flooding to the Carolinas that could last into next week. 10 second trivia. The worst day in U.S. stock market history occurred in what year? 1929, 1933, 1987, or 2008? Black Monday, the worst single day in U.S. stock market history, took place in 1987. And that was because of a percentage drop. The Dow Jones Industrial Average plummeted 22.6% on that single day, but the market recovered relatively quickly. It didn't have a lot of long-term effects. That's unlike what was happening 10 years ago. Lehman Brothers, an international financial services company, went bankrupt on September 15, 2008. It was a tremendous casualty of the Great Recession that hit in 2008 and 2009. Also known as the global economic downturn or the financial meltdown, the recession's effects spread far beyond Wall Street. The U.S. unemployment rate eventually hit 10%. U.S. poverty levels rose, and they took until 2017 to go back down to where they were before the crisis. The ripple effects of the Great Recession led to recessions around the world. The scope of this fall, breathtaking. First, Bear Stearns. Now, Lehman Brothers and Merrill Lynch. Is your money safe? Is your job safe? Economists say this is the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. It was dramatic. It was so dramatic. And what could have happened was so scary. What could have happened if policymakers and bank executives and luck didn't all line up perfectly was your credit card wouldn't work. You wouldn't be able to get money out of your bank account. There could have been a run on the banks. But you didn't want, as a reporter, you didn't want to scare people, but you had to tell them exactly what was happening. Lehman Brothers, for 158 years at Cornerstone on Wall Street. Failure to find a buyer over the weekend means it is now bankrupt. But the mess that Wall Street made is a mess that Main Street is now feeling as banks react with a sharp tightening of credit in a highly uncertain market, making business loans harder to come by. I remember long conversations some on the record, some off the record, with banking officials and bank CEOs and editors trying to make sure we struck just the right tone to let people know, look, this is bad, and maybe millions of people are going to lose their jobs, and a lot of businesses are going to shut down. But you don't want to incite a run on the banks where people panic too much. I mean, it was, it was dramatic, and it was a, I hope it was a once-in-a-lifetime um, set of conversations. The crisis of confidence that first hit home prices, then mortgage investments that financed the housing boom, has now claimed two of Wall Street's most venerable names, Lehman Brothers declaring bankruptcy, Merrill Lynch selling itself to Bank of America, both occurring under Washington's watchful eye. The scary part of it was if Lehman Brothers could fail, and I remember saying this on the air, if Lehman Brothers can fail, what could happen to all these other banks, these bigger banks, these better banks, and others that, are, that, that weren't as solid? What does it say about the American, the international financial system if Lehman Brothers, in business for 158 years, could fall apart in 72 hours? That was what was really scary. Why hang 10 when you can hang 20? Maybe not a common trick for people, but they're not the ones surfing here. In Del Mar, California, there's a surf competition for canines, and most of them seem to like it anyway. Yes, their owners help them catch the waves, but the rest is up to the dogs. The event helps raise money for orphan pets in the area, and so the land lovers don't feel left out. There's also a costume contest. Of course, we'd expect certain breeds to have an advantage in surfing, like the Wave Marauder, the Shipper Key, any of the water dogs, the Chesapeake Bay Retriever, the Chihuahua Wave Rider, and of course the Chinese Crested. But when it comes to sniffing out barking waves, we're pretty sure the champion would have to be the Border Collie. I'm Carl Azus for CNN.